Hi everybody, um, my name's James Close. I'm a, a trustee of the Trust for Sustainable Living uh, and my day job is as the head of the Circular Economy Programme uh, for London, focusing on London becoming a leading low carbon circular city. And I'm really delighted to be uh, moderating uh, this panel for you. We've got uh, three really outstanding um, people here to talk about uh, the impact of climate change. And uh, we're going to run a video and then we're going to uh, open up for some questions and answers across the panel and then hopefully have some time at the end for um, some questions from the audience. And then finally, we're going to finish with an animated poem that uh, one of our panelists, Tom, has written and has been animated and is narrated by uh, the fantastic Jane Goodall. So I think you'll be in very safe hands for the next hour and uh, really look forward to engaging on this discussion for you, with you. So let me just introduce the panel. Um, uh, so first of all, we have uh, Sapna uh, Pramji. So Sapna is currently in uh, Durban and uh, we're delighted that she's joined us as the grand prize winner of the Trust for Sustainable Living International Schools essay competition last year. She attends an eco school, uh, the Eden uh, College in Durban, South Africa, and she's an eco ambassador and president of the Rotary Interact Club. And she's also um, uh, works for Youth for Sharks, uh, ambassador for Wild Oceans, and a program uh, of the NGO uh, Wild Trust. So delighted to have you with us, uh, Satna. Uh, we've also got uh, a, a wonderful colleague of mine uh, that I work with in London, Kate Hands. Kate is, was um, uh, the uh, head of the Secretariat for the London Environment Directors Network and now leads on climate change across all of London's uh, boroughs. And she's done some amazing work in bringing together uh, extraordinary levels of ambition uh, and declarations of intent uh, across the London boroughs where I think, uh, is it 28 have signed up to climate emergencies? And uh, Kate has been very instrumental in all of that. Uh, she's also uh, a trustee of uh, Friends of the Earth, so we're delighted to have you with us, uh, Kate. And finally, we have renowned author and podcaster, I'm delighted to describe you as that, Tom, uh, who's also a, a former uh, colleague. Uh, we worked together very closely when I was at the World Bank, uh, and he's made quite a reputation uh, for really speaking very clearly about uh, the impact of climate change and uh, what we can do to address it. His podcast is called uh, Outrage and Optimism, which he does with Christiana Cuerras and Paul Simpson. And I think the whole Outrage and Optimism uh, uh, motivation for us all in mean, the climate uh, discussion is very powerful. And his book, uh, which you read with Christiana as well, The Future We Choose, is really a, a must read and a great bestseller. So, welcome to you, Tom. Delighted to have you uh, with us. So, perhaps, Eva, if we could queue up the uh, video that would be great and uh, we have a, a video from uh, Patricia Espinoza who is the secretary uh, for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change which is the organization responsible for negotiating uh, the, cl the climate change agreements uh, between uh, countries. So hopefully uh, we can tee up um, uh, Patricia. Patricia. It's a pleasure to be here and I congratulate you for Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and I congratulate you for attending this summit and ways you can align your work with what we do at UN Climate Change. But I'm not here to talk to you about policies. I'm here to talk about possibilities. The world has been through difficult times recently and it will be that way for a while yet. Many of you have made hard choices and seen tough realities. Nothing I or anyone else says can take away the frustration I'm sure so many of you feel. I feel it too, sometimes. We are truly living in exceptional times. But here's the thing about exceptional times. They have provided some of the biggest turning points in history. 
Who would have thought that following the Second World War, the nations of the world could come together and develop a system based on cooperation and multilateralism? It had been tried before, but people kept at it what was once became reality. It's why we have the United Nations today. Who would have thought that at the end of the 1980s, nations of the world could come together and agree how to fix a massive hole in the ozone layer? They did. The ozone layer is healing. And who would have thought nations of the world could slash extreme poverty, boost school attendance by females, and through vaccination, protect so many from dangerous diseases? They did. And while we still have such a long way to go on each of these issues, we have made incredible progress. It was about more than optimism. It was about seeing what was possible and then coming up with a plan that would make it reality. Millions of seemingly small choices, seemingly small policies and individual programs came together and created massive change. Right now, things look difficult, and they are, but they always have been. The world has not changed in that way. But we are here because we are like those who came before. We believe in the possible. And what we believe is possible is a safer, healthier, cleaner, more sustainable, more equal, and more just world for all not for the few, but the many. Youth throughout the world are out front, in many cases far ahead of adults, on these issues. You see how it all connects. You know that addressing climate change can also help us address some of humanity's other biggest challenges. You know that climate change is tied to poverty, to equality, to clean air, to biodiversity, to everything. And while you know that addressing climate change is not easy, in fact, it's incredibly difficult, it's entirely possible. But the only thing that can turn possible into probable is a plan. Ours is a Paris Agreement. To all of you, I say this. While we cannot be physically in one place together, I stand with you. I share your concerns, your frustrations, your hopes, your optimism, and your sincere desire to see positive change in this world. And I truly believe that together we can transform what is possible into reality. desire to see positive change in this world and I truly believe that together we can transform what is possible into reality. Okay so uh, I think we just had a slight glitch on the end there for which apologies but uh, you'll have got the sense of the inspiring words of uh, uh, Patricia Espinosa there and not talking to us about policies but possibilities and turning the possible into the probable and the whole concept of having a plan for that through uh, the Paris Agreement and I think uh, the the actions of all of us individually uh, collectively create this enormous amount of uh, potential change that we can bring to address some of the enormous challenges that we face and I think she very strongly empathised with the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment, and the difficult uh, uh, position that we're in around the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which affects us all globally. Uh, but some stirring words there uh, from uh, uh, Patricia. Um, and Tom, I'd like to uh, start with you on the questions, please. Uh, Tom, uh, you've worked with the uh, UNFCCC and you know the challenges of building partnerships through getting countries uh, to work together. 
how do you see uh, businesses and other partners working together with governments on the climate challenge? And how can we take that optimism that uh, Patricia talks about and channel it into change? Yeah, no, so, well, thank, first of all, thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I love the work of the Trust Sustainable Living. Great to be here with you, James, and, and other panelists. So, so, so very much appreciate uh, the invitation. So the first thing I'd say is that, you know, we have reached the point now where this is an everyone, everywhere initiative, right? Science is extremely clear. We have 10 years to cut emissions in half and then get them to zero quickly after that, or we're going to start precipitating these really quite alarming natural feedback loops, which mean we lose control of the climate, and it becomes less and less possible for us to ever do anything about these, what could become permanent changes, right? So we're about to find out if we're serious about dealing with climate change and we can't mess it up. So that's the first thing. This is, this is the moment for us to determine, these are the 10 years. To say that in the next 10 years, we will have more of an impact on the future than any previous 10 year period in history um, is sounds like hyperbole, but it's not. Now, but when I say that, and, and we notice this, because I talk about this sort of thing a lot, people get this sort of sense of anxiety. They're like, oh my God, you know, I don't know, are we gonna make it? This is, this is frightening. This is a, a moment of great trepidation. So what I would say is that um, in the book that you mentioned at the beginning, The Future We Choose, we set out three different things that we all need to, to, to engage in that collectively will help us to overcome the, the peril and the promise of this moment. And the first is how we show up in that as individuals. Yes, it's very serious. Yes, it's very consequential. Yes, it can be quite alarming and frightening. But actually, how many generations get the opportunity to live at a moment when you can genuinely do something for humanity? We have the chance to live the most meaningful possible lives by embracing this opportunity right now to do what's in front of us and change the future. In the lead up to the Paris Agreement, when Christiana and I were at the UNFCCC, we developed this concept that we called stubborn optimism. And this is not sort of a naive belief that everything's going to be fine or a refusal to look at the facts or anything like that. It is a dedication and a commitment that we have a responsibility right now to do everything we possibly can. And being stubbornly, determinedly optimistic about our possibilities is a motivation and an energy that can then drive us on to more change and can keep us moving forward. You know, all, all great stories have these moments of darkness and challenge, but then if you ride out to meet them and you face them with determination and energy, you can overcome them. So all of us need to find it in ourselves, our courage to show up with that determination right now to be part of the solution. So the first part is who we are, paying attention to how we show up. The second part is our own personal responsibility. You, you've talked about this before, right? Each of us has a footprint, and it, while it's true that none of us can solve this on our own, we're not going to solve it unless we all get on top of that and we take responsibility for it. And it's important for two reasons. The first is that it can be very significant in and of itself. And the second is that if we start taking those actions and we start engaging in it, then we ourselves begin to feel more participatory in it. We begin to feel like it's not happening to us, but we're engaging in and we're helping to shape it. And we're likely to do more and more as we go on. So what we say uh, in the book and has been really useful is, even though it seems like an emergency, look at it in a slightly different time frame, right? We overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what we can do in 10 years. If we said that within 10 years, our carbon footprints need to be less than half they are today, actually, that's enough time. That's enough time for us to get into this with information, organization, investment, and planning, and reduce our emissions by more than half. We'll change our capital intensive items. That's the chance to change our lives, to think about how much we want to fly, et cetera. Thinking of it in that way can create a bit of space that enables us to really make real change. And then the final thing I'd say, the third thing is how we engage with power. So, you know, each of us has a relationship with corporations, with, you know, local governments, with national governments. We need to be much more vocal and we need to remember the muscle of active participation, civil disobedience at times, you know, raising our voices and not being quiet about this because we know that this is so critical. For these next 10 years, we're not going to get the chance to prioritize climate action to this degree again to make this transformation. So make this a number one priority in all of our political engagements. If all of us do that as individuals, as citizens, as employees, then actually we've got every chance of turning this around. And it's going to be really fun. It's going to be the best decade to ever be alive. Thanks, Tom. That, that's brilliant. And I think it's, it's really interesting when you think about our audience here, which is, of course, young people. Uh, for us who are slightly older, a decade, you know, we've lived through a few of them, but for many of our young people here, they've mainly been living over one or two decades. So, uh, and I think That's it's a really, good point. Really, really worth thinking about uh, what we've seen in the last 10 years. And if you think about 
technology and how we now have access to information on the go that means that uh, we don't need a lot of the devices that we all used to accumulate 10 years ago. Uh, think of the transformations we can make in other areas if we put our minds to it. Uh, and I think that's a really hopeful uh, message that everybody can take away, uh, Tom. And I really like this uh, concept of engaging. And, um, and you talked about uh, local government and relationships with the local government. And, and that's, I think, a good opportunity to bring in Kate here, because that's where you, uh, you've spent a lot of your uh, work within London, but you've also been an advocate for this in, in, uh, with, with um, Friends of the Earth and with the RSPB. And how do you see these kind of organisations working together, the NGOs and the cities and government, governments, and how does that relate to the challenge that we face in the Paris Agreement, Kate? Thanks, James. And um, echo Tom's thoughts. I'm really, really, thank you for the invitation. Really happy to be here today. Um, so I think, um, slightly accidentally, I've ended up working for partnership organisations my whole career. Um, and actually, the more I think about it, the more critical I think they are. Um, so we need lots of voices around the table. I think that's the first thing for, for processes like the UNFCCC, and all sorts of others, we need that diversity of voices now more than ever um, so that we don't make the wrong decisions, we don't have a single point of view and that we're actually reflecting a global perspective and, and you know, also having young people in the room, also having different communities in the room. But that can be quite a lot of confusion if you have lots of people around the table. So partnerships play this critical role in kind of distilling uh, and helping people to refine their kind of core shared missions and a lot of what I do is helping people to refine and, and focus on the really important things, the things they can really agree on, which are ambitious, but things that you kind of can come together around, because that helps decision makers, I think, to really focus on, on things that you want. Otherwise, it's kind of a cacophony. Um, so I think, uh, you know, looking, uh, looking at the experience that I had, um, actually, you've talked about RSPB, so that's the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, um, otherwise known as BirdLife UK. So the, the great strength of RSPB is that it is the UK partner of an international network. So there are 100 uh, BirdLife partners in 100 countries, I think more uh, across the world, including BirdLife South Africa, um, and uh, where Sutton is joining us from. And uh, they, so you, you know, when you're engaging with UNFCCC, UNFCCC, which they do, but also the Convention on Migratory Species and, and others, they're saying we're representing a global network, north, south, east, west. This is not just developed global north countries this is actually a diversity of opinion and a huge wealth of knowledge so they bring that real experience as well um, and because they're global they re represent a real credibility and i think that's another really crucial factor of partnerships you have got to be credible because otherwise what really why should people listen to you unless you have a real expertise and a real diversity of opinion um, so yeah i mean i worked um, particularly on the migratory routes of birds um, between kind of UK and, and often West Africa. So a lot of uh, the birds that spend some time here, spend some time there or more time there. So if I'm working in, let's say, Nigeria, working with the government there, I'm, I'm not a credible um, person to start there and say, well, I'm really worried about yellow wagtails, which are a declining species. But actually, you know, you need to think about what are those decision makers concerned about? So 42 out of 195 million Nigerians are not literate. That is a huge government priority for them. So we need to find a way to work with them and work with our BirdLife partner there to make ourselves credible and to understand the needs of that government. So it's about, it's about credibility, it's about diversity, and it's about understanding your audience. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to say, um, and perhaps, yeah, particularly for our audience, is that building relationships within partnerships is so critical. You have to know the people you're working with, and that is quite hard if you're doing it online. It's hard if you can't do it in person, but building that trust within individual partners, between individual people, will enable you to do that work and you can't circumvent that. Those personal relationships are really important. And kind of going back to Tom's point, they make it fun because you have real personal relationships and friendships with really strong ties with the people you're working with. And that really energizes all the work. And it's, and it's hard and it's long and, and you have to put in the hours, but those things really kind of buoy people up in partnerships. So. Yeah, that's, I guess, the reflections on, on why they're so important and, and how we can help to make them better. Thanks, Kate. And I can testify that uh, 
certainly working with you uh, in many of these meetings is fun and you do bring a great energy to it and I think that really does harness many of the advocates and people who are committed to doing this work uh, with a single-minded focus that enables us to uh, refine what we want to try and do so that we do uh, make the transformation that's required as we shift into this uh, uh, new economy and new uh, world that we're going to, uh, to to move towards. And I think, you know, the other the other part is around the, the bird life piece is, of course, the biodiversity aspects of it and the link between climate change and biodiversity loss. So we can really protect our local environments by addressing climate change. And those two things are extremely tightly interlinked. Um, and, and Sapna, uh, you, uh, you know, you're representing young people here on this panel. Um, you've obviously uh, become very engaged in this uh, and, and you, I understand that, uh, that the essay that you did was, was really extraordinary and uh, well worthy of, of winning the grand prize in last year's competition. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, the role that young people uh, play is going to be really important. Um, what's your observations about the way in which young people are participating? And, um, you know, how would you encourage us to think about young people's engagement? So, firstly, I want to say thank you for having me on this panel and giving me the opportunity to share my perspectives. Um, okay, so what I've noticed is that there are two main extreme groups of young people. So there's the first group who sees the climate problem as catastrophic, um, apocalyptic, a crisis, and they're just full of panic. And then there's the second group who's, who, who doesn't really focus on the climate problem a lot. And they are generally, uh, they are either like ignorant of the problem or they have different priorities, such as maybe schoolwork, uh, sports, social life, uh, et cetera. Um, I know that, know that in South Africa, the youth here are especially worried about the access to education and jobs. Uh, for example, in 2015, we had protests at our universities. So the youth were protesting um, for the campaign called hashtag fees must fall. So the campaign was basically about um, demanding for free uh, university education. So that's what our youth is really focused on. So then now we need to get these two extreme groups together in the middle, creating a third group. So, so we need to get the first group into the middle and move them away from the anxiety and more to creating solutions. So what can other people besides the youth uh, help them get into the middle? Uh, it's important to remember that action is the best antidote to eco-anxiety. So then what can teachers do? So in the curriculum, uh, we shouldn't really just focus on the climate problem, but also we should focus on the solutions and practical, solu and practical ways that the youth can help. And we should also encourage students to use their minds to come up with innovative uh, solutions for example, like in science fairs where they can, uh, you know, do, do a project uh, relating to some eco, uh, you know, to an eco idea. And then what can parents do? So what they can do is uh, start sharing their ideas on, on, on uh, lifestyle changes that they can make in the, high, in the household. For example, like buying local, uh, using second-hand products, uh, switching off the lights, spending more time in nature, and you know, also planting trees. So like in the background here, um, as my Zoom background, this is a picture of the speck worm, and it is a very special tree. It is a native uh, indigenous tree to South Africa. 
So uh, in our school eco club, we have been planting this tree just to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. Okay, and um, yeah, and, and then also what can the medical people do, like the psychiatrists and the psychologists do to help calm the anxiety? So uh, they can help uh, children, parents and teachers to move away from the anxiety and more to focusing on the solutions. Okay, so then that's the first group uh, who has the anxiety. Now we need to look at the second group who is not really focused on the problem. So this group needs to realize that the future lies in a new economy. Their, job, their jobs and their livelihoods will rely more on innovative solutions. So they're not just focusing on their needs and their jobs, but they should also focus more on the helping the environment. So what can other people besides the youth help the second group move into the middle? So what, uh, what can be done is that uh, educational institutions can uh, introduce courses to help these, uh, the, uh, these students uh, adapt into the new economy. So in my essay uh, this year, I spoke about how biotechnology, uh, how, how biotechnology courses can be uh, implemented into these educational institutions. And we can use biotechnology to help create solutions to help solve the climate problem. So yeah, thank you. Samna, that was, uh, that was really, really clear and very uh, compelling i think i really like the way you've framed uh, these these two groups and the convergence towards innovation and solutions and that if we can see innovation innovative solutions as the way forward we can harness our anxiety but also increase the level of engagement and i i really like the practical way you talked about the role that parents and teachers and others uh, can um, can play in making that happen. So um, that really a, a very very impressive uh, a description of the of, of the problem and, and the solution. Um, and and I think um, Kate, let's move back to you if you don't mind, um, because I think when you look at uh, London, which has very many boroughs, a lot lot of these are smaller uh, municipalities within the city. Uh, you've got them to work together in a way that perhaps um, nobody really anticipated by getting environment de directors and, and leaders uh, of transport and environment committees to come together to produce a really ambitious, far-reaching joint statement. Can you tell us a little bit about the commitments they've made and why they're important um, and how that can also be part of this innovative solution space that uh, Sapna uh, so eloquently talked about. Absolutely. Um, so just to outline the, the, the way we've done a little bit so that we have this joint statement on climate change across, agreed now by all 33 London boroughs. Um, so it covers a little bit of um, principles from councils in terms of resourcing, how they, how they fund it, how they govern it, who makes decisions and, and how crucially they engage with citizens. So the picture behind me is a group of, you, know, you can kind of see, ladies uh, from Newham, which is the borough where I live, uh, and this is them um, calling for a climate emergency declaration in their borough, which was successful. Um, uh, so, you know, they, these are the kinds of citizens that we need to be kind of engaging with to really co-design proposals. So going back to solutions, yes, local government and other layers of government can come with solutions but they absolutely have to work with people at the local level and they have to meet local circumstances and local needs um, so it does that and it also sets out and this you know for me is it that perhaps the most exciting bit seven areas where boroughs are saying we have to work together on this because no one individual borough can solve the problem of example how to retrofit properties so that they are energy efficient and you know people are now huge fuel bills so they've set out seven areas um, where they're going to do that and they're saying we need to work together and that's you know that's the work that we do across london so on retrofitting uh low carbon new buildings uh, transport uh, consumption emissions jones which i know you know we're working together on green economy 
adaptation, all these kinds of areas. Um, just to go back to that, the how a little bit, because it's that sort of a dry list. Um, I mean, you kindly said at the beginning that I'd sort of been instrumental in kind of helping Boris work on this. But in some ways, the truth is that, that they have driven this agenda um, because each borough, Newham, and now 28 others, 27 others, have signed climate emergency declarations. And that is about political action at the local level. And that goes back to groups like this, calling on their local councillors at the most local level of, of government and saying, we want this. You know, some councillors say more than 10 letters on a single subject within that maybe a couple of months. That is a big deal. That is local people really saying we care about this. Um, so they've really responded to that and they've, they've, they've passed these declarations and then they're sort of saying, oh, okay, well, we so we're going to be net zero by 2030 in many cases. So oh, how are we, <laughs> we going to do that? Um, and that's where we come in to say, okay, you've got the political will and that is a mandate for us to help them to do that work. So I, I cannot emphasize enough how much the local political um, momentum supports the work that we do because we don't have a mandate to act otherwise, but we have a mandate to help them when they said, this is a priority for us. Um, so I think, you know, that's one of the key things. Um, yeah, the energy and commitment really comes from them. So yeah, I can talk more about it, but yeah, I'll leave it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, and I think that that's very clear, Kate, and uh, just in case any of our uh, uh, viewers think I'm a bit of a spoil sport, I did have a really rather good uh, virtual background, but unfortunately it uh, rather gives me uh, um, a flower-based beard, so I thought I'd uh, better go back to the non-virtual background, so um, there is something sort of charming about it though, maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, so Kate, I think, you know, you link this very nicely with uh, what both Satna and Tom have talked about. Um, uh, you know, Tom, you, you know, it, it came through very strongly, this sort of uh, local engagement being a, an important part of, you know, climate optimism and the whole stubborn optimism of what we're trying to do here. And Satna, your kind of description of uh, the way your young people can engage is so important around that. Um, and we've seen activism in lots of different uh, uh, ways. And I sat and I'd ask, like to ask you a little bit about what your thoughts are on some of the climate strikes and uh, what do you hope comes from these actions and uh, what advice would you give uh, to people who are listening? Okay, so, well, I, I'm not a firm believer in climate strikes, firstly, because it creates just a lot of panic. And secondly, uh, a lot of these strikes involve leaving school, which I don't think uh, should be done really, because you know, when you leave school, you, you're not really getting as much of an education as you should. And we need to have an education to help come up with these innovative solutions to solve the climate problem. Uh, I know that at our school, we hold a thing called climate marches, which is different. So we don't leave school to do to uh, well, well, to raise awareness about the climate. We just do it during our free time and at breaks. Um, I also feel the same about uh, petitions, which I think is a form of of a slack slackism, <laughs> uh, yeah, but which is really a weak form of uh, activism. So, yeah, so I'm not really focused on like strikes and petitions. I'm just really more focused on the solutions, um, concrete uh, uh, actions and empowerment. So then how do we empower the youth? So just before lockdown, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to be nominated to participate in an environmental law workshop. So this was part of my training uh, uh, for the Youth for Sharks program. Uh, we had an environmental lawyer to train us on the South African constitution, the various environmental laws, uh, court and court uh, judgments. And we were also taught about how to request for, uh, records of how companies are complying with licensing conditions. Uh, the part that I most enjoyed about the workshop was the role play 
between the government, uh, industry, and NGOs. Uh, it really just brought uh, all the learning to life, really. Um, the, the lawyer uh, who was providing the training uh, well, was recently preventing a company uh, from, from drilling gas off the, off the coast uh, of, Mo of Mozambique. So, so this workshop was held to increase the area of allocated marine protected areas. To me, that one workshop helped me to realize that the community and the youth of, of what can use the law to help solve the climate problem. The youth can also empower themselves by going to, you know, by um, considering careers in the new economy. So uh, I spoke in my essay, uh, as I mentioned, about the biotech uh, industry where students can consider careers and biotechnology to help uh, invent uh, solutions. And also, as young people are getting ready to vote, they can put pressure on their councillors and political parties to say that if you, if you want my vote, then this is what you're going have to, then this is what you have to do for me then. Uh, in addition to that, we also have to start supporting sustainable businesses, um, you know, putting pressure on businesses to be more sustainable and plant more trees, etc. Great, thank you, Satna. And I, I think it's really good that we're having this conversation about activism and lots of people will have different views on the best way to approach activism. Um, but I think the most important thing is that people are thinking about this and we really appreciate your uh, way in which you've concluded how, what activism means for you and how you want to engage in that. And I think that's a very powerful lesson for all of our audience here is, is make it personal and, and commit to it and, and actually get out and do some of these things. Um, and Tom, I'm going to turn to you next, um, because I think um, we talked a little bit at the beginning about outrage and optimism and the motivations uh, that um, the people take on around that. And of course, uh, Sapna has talked about cl climate anxiety, which is a very, very uh, real thing. Um, what's, what do you think is the best way uh, to reach people, to get them talking about climate change uh, and how we can work together to uh, address this challenge and also take advantage of the opportunities that you described earlier as well. Sure, I can have a crack at that. And, and just to say, I'm, I'm, really, just, I'm really impressed at how thoughtful my fellow panelists are and Sapna, you know, the, the depth of thought and analysis you've brought to this is, is really impressive. So it gives me a great deal of, of optimism and courage for the moment we're in uh, to meet you both. Um, so I would say, you know, the key question is who's talking and who's listening? in that, right? You know, um, Satna made a very good point that, you know, some people, people respond differently. I mean, I see quite a, a, an interesting sort of almost dichotomy in the climate movement where there is a group of people who are by nature activists and determined and, you know, really want to create change. And they basically have an, a, a narrative and a model of saying, we are going to demand everything we want. And if we get anything less than that, then then you're part of the problem and we need to move in that direction. And then there's another group who sort of say, well, what we'd like to do is like take a first step and move in a positive direction that precipitates more momentum and then that momentum creates more change and in the end we get to where we want and i i think a big part of is is, is what's appealing to people and and different ways of engaging that will be appealing to different people at different times in their life as well right so um both of those are necessary complacency is a massive problem because People aren't aware of this issue. They don't know what the challenge is. So they need to be woken up out of that by that sense of determination and alarm that, 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 that sort of hits them like a, like a truck and reminds them that we've got to make major changes. But that at that moment, there's a lot of risk, right? Because that's when you can really get quite anxious. You can really sort of, you know, look at the data and conclude, we're not going to make it. You know, what's the future going to be like? So you then also need... To, to be able to focus on the other elements that are, you know, the seeds of change and the momentum of change and be able to know how to understand that transformation. I mean, 
you know, one little example of this, not to go down too much of a tangent, is if you look at electric vehicles and you look at, you know, which are, most people would agree some part of the solution, we might argue about exactly how much, look at how many there are in the world and you can begin to think, God, it's not really happening. You know, we're, we're a bit getting a bit stuck. Then if you look at the rate of change and you start mapping the rate of change onto a graph, you realize that exponential maths is a wonderful thing when it works in your favor, and you can actually transform things remarkably quickly, faster than you think you possibly could, right? So you have to be able to identify and pull out those stories for different points on that journey in terms of like, you know, do you really call for the outcome you really want, or do you just engage and then look at the steps you can take? But then the final thing I'd say is, there does remain a hard core of people who aren't on this journey with us, and what I've learned in that is I'm often not the right people to, person to talk to them. You know, if I, if there's a, my dad's a petroleum geologist, all his friends working on and gas, they're all climate skeptics, et cetera. I'm clearly not the right person to talk to them, but you know, a thoughtful geologist who understands this issue who can explain it to them in their language. So it's always worth asking the question if it's a, if it's a religious person who, who doesn't buy into this on religious grounds, probably another religious person of the same faith and the same denomination is the right person to have that conversation. So it's also worth just thinking, don't bash your head against a brick wall trying to convince somebody. You might not be the right person to have that conversation. So be a bit strategic and think about how that should happen. Yeah, I think that's great advice, uh, Tom. And um, I, I think, you know, we have so much to do and limited amounts of energy. So uh, we've got to focus that energy on the places where we're going to get mad maximum return and just dissipating it on uh, things that cause you anxiety and uh, distress is, isn't, isn't particularly helpful. So some great advice. Now we've got a few minutes left. and I, I want to leave time for the, uh, for the poem that I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to ask the panelists um, around the key point that they would like to make very briefly. And, and perhaps also uh, you talked about uh, uh, exponential arithmetic working in our favor uh, Tom, sometimes it works against us, like the COVID-19 pandemic. And perhaps what, what should we take away from this conversation in the context of COVID-19 and the pandemic? And then I'd like to open it up to a couple of questions from the audience. So we've got on the chat uh, some questions coming in. But please, if you'd like to uh, ask questions to uh, Tom, Kate and Sapna, now's your opportunity and I'll, I'll feed them in to them. Um, so I think um, perhaps we'll start with you, Satna. Uh, what's what, what's your kind of key takeaway from this conversation, and what what uh, advice would you give us in the context of COVID nineteen? Okay, so both COVID nineteen and climate change are situations where the world has never been before. So it's going to take our collective efforts to address issues and recover from it. So the youth have a huge role to play in building a better future. And I will encourage them to move away from fear and anger to optimism and opportunities for innovative solutions. That's where our energy should be directed. So yeah, I wish everyone a successful Partner Power Summit for the rest of the week. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Satna, and, and made all the better for your really inspiring and well thought through words. So really grateful for that. Kate, perhaps to you next. Uh, what would your takeaway be and how would you contextualise this in pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think um, if I can steal from someone uh, better than me, from Christina Pagrelas, as she said, and other people have said, what this shows us is that prevention is better than cure. Like, we should have known that already. Um, but you know, it really, really has woken up a lot of people who perhaps thought that this wasn't an issue they were really cared about, or they cared more about the end of the month and the end of the world and that kind of stuff. But I think this has, you know, helped a lot of people to make the kind of metaphorical links of what we're talking about and how we feel as environmentalists. And I think I hope that this will be a really powerful uh, stimulus, and certainly the kind of practical things that are coming out of COVID in terms of recovery packages and economics change. Like in London, we're seeing a lot of energy around saying we can use this this is a critical moment to embed kind of low carbon futures and to really make those decisions and put the money where we need to to invest in our infrastructure and the rest and in our communities um just two other things so one is that i think i think young people in civil society groups in general are really good at um linking i think someone i think james uh, john maybe said this at linking across the goals so looking at the sdgs 
and linking across the goals because in I don't know, grown ups and organisations can get very siloed in kind of like, well, we're doing this one and this is our programme of work and it all gets very kind of technical. Um, but actually stepping back from that and looking across the piece is so important. And decision makers, like, they don't necessarily have the answers. Like, it's a good thing to remember. You go and you're trying to advocate for a moment make change. Don't think that politicians have the answers. They often don't. They want to know what you think. They want to know the answer. Uh, if you can help them, do it. That always surprised me when I started talking to MPs that they just didn't know the answer necessarily and they wanted to have the answer so don't don't be shy about saying that I'm sure people won't be um, and the other thing which I found really powerful um, and just speaking to that point um, I heard some I think someone from Greenpeace say this a long time ago they they said you know young people uh, I think in the context of um, kind of civil rights struggles can very much like you know I would lay down my life for this and he said well the, the challenging thing is not to say I will give my life but I will give my whole life to this challenge because it is a long it is a long challenge and that I mean, that is a big big call to action but for me that was really powerful and seeing the, the long picture in this and we will have we will fail at stuff we will not get everything right but we we absolutely have to keep that optimism and that determination to to deliver in the in the long run great thank you very much kate um and um i'm going to sort of paraphrase a couple of the uh questions and observations that are coming in through the uh, through the web chat and, and and they're really focused very much about innovation and some of it is really at the extreme ends of innovation around uh, our relationship with the rest of the uh, uh, the solar system and 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 what we should think about uh, in terms of the really long term um, uh, you know population of mars and things like that and also some of the really uh, avant-garde new technologies that are out there. But maybe um, the panelists just like to reflect on what they see as some of the potentially transformational uh, innovations that might be coming here and how we should uh, harness some of those. So what, in your opinion, in say 30 to 50 years might be the things that we say we're really pleased we spent some time on uh, in the last, you know, two or three years. I don't know where to start here. Tom, you're looking as though you might have an answer to this. I, I, I don't actually. So um, do you mean sort of like um, things that we, um, like transformational innovation, like technology or social innovation, or, yeah, or, or do you not mind? What are, what are the big game changing things out there that we don't talk about very much? I mean, you talked a little bit about electric vehicles. But yeah. you know, if you think about, <laughs> 30, 50 years ago, we didn't think information technology would be what it is. You know, right. 50 years time, we're doing some extraordinary work in, uh, in, in, uh, in space and, you know, that sort of activity. We're doing some, you know, really far reaching innovation around uh, different forms of energies and technologies. What, 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 how would you think about that really? Got it. In the outrage and optimism context that you're uh, promoting. Got it. So, so I mean, there's so many, right? But one I would hit on because we don't always talk about it is innovations around around the food systems and around the agricultural systems, right? So, I mean, we have no idea the degree to which computational agriculture, AI and robotics is going to completely transform the way in which we grow food, the additional efficiency by which we can do that. I mean, um, the whole field of phenotyping at the moment, you know, AI technology that can photograph plants on an hourly basis over a large period of time, mash that up through an algorithm and give early warning if there is a pest or if there's a disease that affects that quickly that can then mean we don't need any herbicides, we don't need any pesticides, um, you know, maybe don't even need much fertilizer as well. That facilitates a completely different kind of agriculture. Um, when you combine that with the rise of plant-based, I mean, it's very interesting. If you look in 10 years time, we will be nowhere near half of the United States being plant-based, but we will be at half the meals in the United States being plant-based. So actually, if, you, if we carry on on current trends, so the dietary trends are really interesting and we're going to move beyond eating meat more quickly than, than, than we think we will, right? So I think that's one of the big transformations that we'll look back on. I think that we'll look back on the period of time when we used to just catch wild fish and take it out of the ocean. Uh, you know, in all of our lifetimes, I think that will be something that, that feels as ancient as, as most 
meat being wild now feels today. And I think the introduction of, again, robotics, AI, um, computational agriculture, to really get fish farming right and do it in such a way that it doesn't then create pollution and does it in a, in a constructive, environmentally beneficial way. I think it's a very exciting whole area that's got lots of innovation going into it in the moment um, that, will, that will change the way we eat fundamentally quite quickly. Right. No, I, I think that's very true, isn't it? And uh, it's also changed very quickly over the last 30 to 40 years. True. As well. Yeah. Yeah. How we are then. Um, so, uh, you know, we can we can alter that trajectory in, in a really positive fashion, I think. And that's yeah. really, really interesting. Kate, how about how about you? What's your kind of game changing innovation yeah. here? I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to be controversial and boring at the same time here. Um, by saying that, and partly so clearly much less well versed in this stuff than Tom and probably you are, uh, and we'll just have as well. Uh, but um, I, I see around me a lot of amazing solutions that we already know, we already have. Uh, I was, I've been reading Project Drawdown, which I would absolutely recommend to everyone. You know, we know what a lot of the solutions are, and you know, we do a lot of work on retrofitting buildings to be more longevity really and we've known about this for a long time we are not doing it and it's it really frustrating that because we know we know how to do these things and we do not do them and that is our problem i would say and you know finding a way to make existing in some cases quite easy low-cost solutions making them exciting to policymakers and giving a real energy and innovation behind ideas that we already have i think is sometimes a bigger challenge than bringing along something um uh, shiny, with no disrespect to new tech, which we absolutely need, but you know what I mean, policymakers often go yeah. for something that's shiny and new, when actually we need yeah. to repackage stuff that we know works. So that, that would be my plea. Yeah, so great. And, and Sapna, final thought from you about innovation, I mean, in solutions, and you've described to us how to create the space to do that. What would you like to see as, the, uh, as the, some of the, the, the major developments out there? So uh, I was um, I was reading a lot, you know, about these technologies. I know for uh, for example, um, they're trying to use nanotechnology to help uh, materials, fabrics, and leather to last faster, which is um, especially important for like the fashion industry, where we just keep buying and buying and buying, and then you know these clothes and shoes, then they get, you know, there's there's wear and tear, you know, and we need to start, you know, reducing the amounts that we buy. Um, also, uh, technology can also help us to maybe convert the CO2 that's in the atmosphere into useful yeah. products as well. Great, good. And I, I think that's, uh, that's a couple of really good ideas uh, to, to leave on that. Um, so I, I'm going to uh, close now uh, here with just a, a, a few thoughts. I mean, I think it's been a wonderful panel and, and really some inspiring words about how to get engaged in the opportunities that we face and the challenges that climate change uh, presents us. And, you know, my advice to those of you watching would be, you know, to do as the, the panelists suggested and to get involved in uh, advocacy and politics to continue to work hard in your studies so that you can be well equipped to uh, address some of these challenges and take advantage of the opportunities and to talk to people and particularly like-minded people to give them the courage to act and the stubborn optimism uh, that uh, that we all need to fuel us uh, in this challenge that we face and uh, you know final thought you know do subscribe to outrage and optimism uh, the podcast and do read tom and christiana's book they're brilliant uh, um, tools for us as we go on our climate journey here. So uh, without anything else, I'd just really like to thank Satna, Kate and Tom for some really, uh, really inspiring and thoughtful and brilliant uh, contributions. Uh, and also everybody on the TSL side who's made this happen and uh, run uh, the webinar uh, behind the scenes as well. So with that, I think uh, Eva uh, will cue uh, Tom's poem. Um, Tom, you, before you we show it. Would you like to say a word or two about it? Sure, I can do. So this is um, a, an enormous surprise to me that I ever did anything like this. I do very little creative things of this type in my life. Um, and um, it, it's called What Happened When We All Stopped.
And it came to me while I was doing the washing up one evening in its entirety, and I didn't do any further work on it at all. I just wrote it down. Um, and, you know, like many things that all of us, I suppose, do, I, I felt a little bit sort of shy about it and whether it was any good. And I shared it with a friend of mine uh, called Logan Smalley, who runs TED Ed. And, and Logan grabbed it and said, actually, I think this could really could capture something of the moment. So uh, we shared it with Jane Goodall um, and she really liked it. So she narrated it. My sister actually did some illustrations for it as well that formed the original idea. So that's available at whathappenwhenweallstop.com. Um, and then off the back of that, uh, this brilliant Israeli illustrator called Avi created uh, what you're about to watch. So it's been a really, really fun project of a type that I very rarely do. Great. Well, thank you for doing it and I hope you enjoy it, everybody. And thanks for joining us today. Today we have something a little different. Dr. Jane Goodall is going to tell you a story. Stay tuned after the animation to learn how to download this as a free children's book. Ready? Let's begin. It starts as a whisper, a word on the air. It can't quite be heard, but you know that it's there. As gentle as sunlight, as tenacious as hail, in its route to the heart, it could not but prevail. And the people looked up from their day-to-day -day tasks, their day-to-day -day jobs, and their day-to-day -day masks. They heard, or they felt, where the whisper could lead, and they looked with eyes wide at what that might mean. And once they could see it, they hadn't a chance to resist the sweet song of the deep spell it cast. The feeling it brought them at first glance was pain as they lifted their eyes on the land they had claimed since they saw at last as if raised from a dream they were almost alone on the land and the sea but the trees had almost gone and the bees had almost gone and the creatures in their shells by the seas had almost gone. And the people felt sad as they saw their new earth. But they knew this was it. One wild chance for rebirth. Breaking new ground, seeds rolling down, smell of the earth on your hands and your brow. No time for sorrow, we're building tomorrow. The sound of things growing now keeps us around. As the wildness grows and the deep wood grows and the sense that the future's come to meet you grows, there's no chance we can rest. We must do our best. This moment can lead us back home. That's our test. It starts as a whisper on the air. It can't quite be heard, but you know that it's there. It then spoke like thunder until we all moved, and we could, and we did, and it's done. She's renewed. Help turn the whisper into a roar by sharing this poem today. You can download the illustrated book for free at ed.ted.com slash whisper. Or keep your soul a flutter with one of these animated poems. Great. Thank you, everybody. And fantastic, uh, Tom. And I uh, hope you all enjoy that. Share that with your friends. Watch the rerun on Facebook and uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, the conference bye thanks bye thanks bye <laughs>